welcome to the Infinity Bros podcast, the only podcast that is perfectly balanced as all things should be. I am your host, Max Mosier, back again with you today, wherever you're listening, however you're listening. Thanks for making us part of your podcast experience. I'm here with two of our other six Infinity Bro rotating cast members. First, it is the man behind the ch- the man in front of the chair behind the computer. It is Isaac Edland. Isaac, how are you? In front of the chair behind the computer. That's a very accurate description of where I am right now. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And is he in his mom's basement or is he just a single bachelor in the age of 30? It's Zane Ellis. How's it going? Happy to be here. You know, we're... Feeling good, a lot of energy. Worked last night, so I'm just kind of in that that prime prime energy zone right now. You're like 9 p.m. max. Literally, like <laughs> that's what it is for me right now. I love that about yep. you. That's actually bonkers to me that this is like your prime energy because when I get done with my night shifts, I like crash immediately when I get home. Like I'm already crashing at 5 a.m. when I'm still at work. <laughs> well, part of it, it, like it really depends on the night. So like f- for me on nights like this coming home, it's way easier because like now I'm on to my weekend. So like coming home Thursday morning, like I don't, sure, you know, sure, sure, my sure. weekend starting. So it's it's that Friday night feeling like you get off work, you're just all amped up. So yeah. That's why it's always like, hey, let's do these Thursday mornings. Just drink like, a can of Baja Blast energy drink at work <laughs> and gets home and just ready to. That's right, ready we're to ready to go. Up. That's right. AM podcasts get wild around here, man. Thanks for checking us out. You can check us out on our socials. Anything you want to connect us with outside, check the link in the description. That's all we'll say about that. We got a jam packed show today. We're talking about the Mandalorian episode five. We haven't really been doing episode by episode synopsis, so I'm sure we'll talk about some other episodes. But we also have some nerd news on the front of this. We're going to get to. There's been some big things happening in the world of Marvel and DC, in particular around a specific film getting released, and then the transition of a Mister James Gunn taking over Superman. We're going to talk about that plans as Superman Legacy will be directed by James Gunn. We're also going to talk about uh, Disney having some very fascinating issues happening in their uh, studio. Some serious things and some uh, crazy things. So we're going to talk about that. And, of course, uh, the shenanigans will abound with uh, Mandalorian and Bad Batch on the back end. So you'll not want to miss this one. Uh, yeah. So before we get into anything, we want to make sure that you're familiar with our rating system and how we rate things on this show. So we're going to put that bumper right here. Here on the Infinity Bros podcast, everything is ranked from a zero to six point scale. Zero meaning horrible, and six meaning absolutely excellent. If all of the Infinity Bros rank something a six, it gets an infinity snap. And then also, we probably, there's a good chance that we're going to spoil everything that's happened in the Mandalorian episodes one through five. So I'm going to go ahead and just give a universal spoiler warning right now for the Mandalorian episodes one through five of season three. This is... Prepare yourself. An Infinity Bros. Prepare yourself. Spoiler. Ah! Let's get into some nerd news first. Hey, Zane, I was looking into getting into this Gunpla thing. There's one called the Unicorn Banshee. What the heck is that all about? Um, actually, Jarrett, what you're thinking of is RX-0 Unicorn Gundam 2 Banshee, which is from the Mobile Suit Gundam. Uh, actually, you know what? It's time for nerd news. Zane, there's a lot of stuff going on at Marvel. And I'm thankful that Infinity Bro Robbie's not here because if you follow us at all on socials, it's like the guy is is just ecstatic to talk negatively about Marvel. He if if Robbie has a catchphrase, it is the fall of Marvel. And so here's kind of the timeline of what's been happening. We had Ant-Man Quantumania have a biblically bad second week, uh, over over 80 percent drop from the first week to the second week. It's only made just under five hundred million dollars now in its its theatrical runtime. Post COVID and pre COVID, it's the worst by far outside of you know the early release ones that happened, uh, the Hulk and uh, Iron Man two. Then you have um, Mr. Jonathan Majors get in his incident at New York, where allegedly he assaulted a thirty one year old girlfriend. Friend, I don't, I, I don't, the, it's kind of fuzzy their relationship. There's some reports saying he uh, called the police on her. There's other reports saying she called the police on him. It's fuzzy in how that is going on. And then additionally, his lawyer is saying publicly that he has two records of 
people, eyewitness accounts saying he did not do this, as well as video footage. But then you have an, a director afterwards come out on a previous film saying he was the worst person to work with on the set. He was vile. He was evil. I'm quoting this director directly. You could see all these links in the show notes. I'll put them in the show notes. I'm not going to kind of go through those right now. It's been in the news. So let's start with Jonathan Majors. There's three pillars here to the Marvel thing. Quantum Mania we talked about. If you've never, if, if you want to hear our Quantum Mania thoughts, go back to the previous episode. I think we do a great job talking about that. Let's talk about Jonathan Majors real quick. How big of a problem is this for Marvel, Zane? Is this a big deal where like they need to absolutely move everything? And if they have to move him out of production, because we just got an Ant-Man, spoiler alert for those that haven't seen Ant-Man, the post credit scene is literally showing infinite Kings. As Jonathan Majors in in the court of Kang, essentially. Uh, so is do you feel like this could absolutely hurt the brand of Marvel and how they're moving forward if Jonathan Majors does not continue in this role? Well, absolutely. Like they you can tell they banked so much of what's coming on him, and he's that big villain. It's just like, could you imagine if well, I guess it's not even a sense of imagining because it's just like it if this would have, you know earlier on and it would have been Josh Brolin. Well, it's like Thanos is all digital, like wh- whatever you can CGI that out, but like you're using Jonathan Major's face. Like he is Kang. Like this isn't like a CGI recreation. This isn't, you know, superimposed. It's just like a lot of those eggs are in that basket for the future of the Marvel. So it's just like, this is, this is huge. Like I, I feel like this very much became a very muddy, muddy situation because it, if I like, I don't know what you pivot from. Like, do you just try to drop this quick and like, all right, we got to speed stuff up. Do you just try to go a different route? But, hey, someone else is going to be king. Do you, yeah, instantly kind of get him exit stage right and bring in another villain? Like, I, I, I don't know because we we saw how it worked when with the loss of Chadwick Boseman of how that affected Black Panther too. So to immediately do that again on something, I think that could be very difficult. That is a very fair point, Zane. And that I think that movie crushed how they honored Mr. Boseman at the front end of the movie, but it still was a problem. I mean, you could go back and hear our review of that on a previous episode as well. Isaac, I mean, this guy just crushed it in Creed three. I saw it. I give it a 5.8 out of six. And he's been in the U.S. Army commercials for recruitment. $117 million allegedly went into these commercials. All of them pulled immediately after they heard this. What are your thoughts, Isaac? Is, is, are you in the same camp as Zane? Do we think that Marvel is in a massive backpedal mode right now with Jonathan Majors having this new news? This is a tough uh, subject because, I mean, it's obviously terrible timing for uh, Jonathan Majors and the MCU right now. But... There's just so much going on on social media about this that I think Marvel just has to sit and wait and see. Like you like you mentioned, Max, the Jonathan Majors uh, lawyers are saying that he's got eyewitnesses saying he didn't do any of this stuff. Um, I apparently the the woman recanted uh, her her allegations as well. Um, th- that's what I've been seeing on social media. I don't know what the official story is. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's so on muddy, media. Isaac. It's, it's very, so muddy. Very muddy right now. So I think Marvel just has to sit and wait right now. And really the only way you can make this work like would be a straight recast. If if all this were true and if you know if it comes to that, I don't think we're anywhere close to that point yet. But if it were true... And if it came to that point, the only way you could move on would be a straight recast and pretend like nothing happened. Pretend like like everything is the same. We have the same story, same everything, which would present its own problems because Jonathan Majors, like you said, is crushing this role as Kang. You'd have to find somebody who is a very, very talented actor that could fill in his shoes like right off the bat. But I think it's way too early to talk about any of that stuff right at this moment because because of all the murkiness that's going on. It is really interesting, though, because typically, I mean, MCU and Disney in general 
keeps their actors noses pretty clean. I'm sure they have some contract stuff saying like, Hey, if you get in any trouble, like you will be, you know, your contract will be terminated immediately type of stuff because they're, I mean, historically they're able to keep their, their actors pretty clean. So this is a very interesting situation and it will be very interesting to see how it develops. This has always been a threat to this whole thing. A huge threat to the Marvel idea and brand has been, what if somebody does something stupid? What if somebody says something stupid? What if somebody passes away? What if somebody has a career debilitating injury like Jeremy Renner happened a couple months ago? Uh, and, and he's allegedly going to be okay. But that was one of those moments where it was like, is Jeremy Renner just off the table now? He's alive in this universe. like, And his story is very much up in the air. I, I would echo what both of you are saying. I, I think I want to wait and get all the information first with the decisions like this in, in general, period, universally. It's it's not just Jonathan Majors because of his Kang position. I Not to be mean to Jonathan Majors, but he is replaceable. I do think Kang is replaceable. I've heard some people say, let's put John Boyega there. I would put my hand up for that. I think that would be a fine recast. He's worked with Disney before. He's got some great talent is he as good as jonathan majors maybe not but i think he could do the role if somebody needed him to come in if somebody else has to come in and take this role i don't think that's a bad thing i i i I would disagree with you zane you're you've made the first argument though of legitimacy of like hey here's data pointing to this with black panther i think that's a fair argument where i'm interested in this is how quickly jonathan majors camp communicated this and how quickly people recanted statements. I don't know what that means. Does it mean that he really didn't do it? Or does it mean that everybody behind the scenes is trying to cover this up? I, it's so difficult to tell. And it's what makes this whole process incredibly weird and frustrating. If Jonathan Majors assaulted this woman, he needs to be off of this project. Period. That's how I feel about the subject on it. it it's it's abhorrent. It's not good behavior. If he didn't do it, then it needs to be it needs to be said that he didn't do it. It's fake. We move on. We're not saying anything that I think anybody in the news has said, but we haven't talked about it. We wanted to put that out there to make sure that uh, we had addressed it. Ike Perlmutter was released on Wednesday, March 29th. This article came out at 350. Um, he's been known for being frugal forever. He's the reason that Kevin Feige almost left Marvel a decade plus ago because Ike was working at the time in Marvel television. Uh, He has obviously been in their entertainment wing, which is what handles the television side of things until until, um, uh, Disney Plus started getting through the fold. And uh, this has been, in my opinion, a long time coming. He is part of the 7,000 jobs being eliminated, which is 4% of Disney's global staff. $5.5 billion worth of cuts were were intended to improve Disney's financial results and positions. There's a lot of people in a lot of spheres saying that, you know, Disney went either too woke or they spent too money, too much money on their Disney Plus and movie platforms. The Marvel movies are not panning out. Uh, They spent too much money on Avatar has been an argument. Star Wars has not been doing well. Um, Allegedly Mandalorian. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but Mandalorian is having its worst season in terms of viewership ever. Are people inundated with content? There's a million different arguments for why Disney's doing what it does. Obviously, the previous regime had issues with COVID and didn't do, Chapek did not do a great job with the theme parks. Bumped the prices and attendance went down. So, My question here with Ike Perlmutter is this, is this a sign that Marvel is struggling or is this just, this is just honestly Iger coming in and saying, we've got to clean this up. We got a little too fat and happy. We got to get back to what made us what we are, especially in lieu of what's happening right now with Mr. Majors that could affect everything in Marvel. Zine, what are your thoughts? Um, I feel like it could be a little bit of both. Like, I feel like, especially with how reception has been from, phase four and five and everything has been, I feel like part of this could be like, Hey, we need some shakeup, but now granted like this seven thousand Cause I heard him talk about it on the radio this morning. Like this is across all of Disney property. So from Disney ESPN, like all of it. So it's not like it's just one section that got gutted or anything. Um, so I think there's part of it of just like, Hey, it could, you know, money wise. Like, I mean, you got, 
the whole overarching business you're looking at because it's a giant entity. Yeah, I get it from that aspect. But I also think, yeah, that also provides some of an opportunity to be like, we need some fresh people in some of these spots because we're kind of trending down right now on what our movies have been. So maybe we need some fresh faces. We need some fresh ideas. That could be part of it. So I, I don't think I could necessarily lean particularly one way or the other. I feel like the answer is probably more in between both of those or he, he made the sale. Disney got Marvel because of him. He was part of that process. He did do the TV thing, but then Kevin Feige took over in 2015 of all of Marvel after Avengers. And so then he reported directly to Kevin Feige and went off of television altogether in 2019. So I think that's another part of this is like, yes, him and Kevin did not like each other, but they honestly haven't been working with each other. His role honestly has been more behind the scenes. It hasn't been as, I think people read this and go, oh my gosh, a big Marvel person's there. It's like, He's been losing the roles as this has gone. His big his big thing he's known for that I think Disney does owe him a pat on the back on is the acquisition of it. So, uh, Isaac, thoughts on this? Yeah, um, nothing, you know, that you guys haven't really mentioned. I mean, he has been around Marvel for a very long time. I think he's been a part of the, like, board of directors of Marvel since, like, the early 90s or something like that. So he is, he's, like, you know, been involved. And like you said, he's was pretty influential in that acquisition by Disney. Um, but like you said, also, you know, he was, I believe the head of Marvel studios and then Kevin Feige took over that role. He went back to being the chairman of, um, Marvel entertainment. So that's the, that's the distinction that I kind of want to, that I kind of got out of this is like, they're eliminating his role as the chairman of Marvel entertainment, which is Marvel right now. Marvel Studios is, you know, the movie side of things. Marvel Entertainment is like everything Marvel, like the comic books, merchandising, products, all that stuff. So, and I saw a quote somewhere, which I'm not, I'm not sure where this came from. Um, it's, it's a quote in an article that I read that uh, Disney thinks that um, his role as the chairman of Marvel Entertainment was um, irrelevant, which I thought was interesting for the for the future of Marvel Entertainment. Marvel Studios is safe as long as they keep bring, bringing in money. Like Absolutely. Kevin Feige is going to do that. Like, yeah, and and, and Ant Man made money, by the way, people. So like, oh yeah, yeah. Infinity Bro, Robbie. You, you know, just stop taking your anger about DC out on Marvel. <laughs> they they're finally having yeah. some hiccups in their in their movies. They're still making gangbusters. I mean, we'll talk about like, oh, movie. this is this is terrible. Didn't make any money. It still almost made five hundred million dollars. Like it's still making a profit. You know, like it, it's it's not like it's losing money for Marvel or anything like that. Dude, making making profit for Disney is all that matters because they they have tons of movies that don't make profit right exactly yeah so the the other side of that is if they think marvel entertainment is irrelevant is that does that mean that they are going to kind of dissolve the whole marvel side of things and just bring marvel into disney as a whole like i don't really know what that means for marvel entertainment if they think that that role i actually think it's good on both ends isaac i i i read this first off i palm motor as far as i'm concerned the only good thing he did was that acquisition that's it he was known for being rigid frugal and he's been known for being the major hiccups like for example the 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 netflix shows how they were trying to connect to the Marvel stuff. And Kevin Feige was like, this is how you have to do it. And he was like, no, we're going to do it this way. Any issues you have with connections are because of Ike Perlmutter. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is Marvel entertainment hasn't really been good to call a spade a spade. The movies have been really good, but their entertainment stuff has been meh. Maybe some of their board games that like a very small audience like us would like have been good or Marvel snap has been good. I know you guys are big Marvel snap guys, but the general audience isn't doing those things. I think Disney taking that on is a really good thing. And I think Ike Perlmutter not being in that is a good thing. This is a good move for Marvel and DC or Marvel and Disney. Excuse me. This is a very, very good move for Marvel and Disney. I anticipate this helps them. You get out with the old in with the new um, and, and all that stuff. Now let's talk about Victoria Alonzo. Now Victoria Alonzo gets let go. And this is just, this is the one where it gets really interesting to me. Victoria Alonso has essentially been in this role from day one with Marvel. 
day one. And she has been the head of CGI. Uh, so part of her role was during the time of being during COVID, she had 11 properties that she was overseeing during of CGI during COVID. 11 properties. I want it to be, I want to make that point right out the gate. For people that are dunking on her for whatever reason, okay? So apparently there have been some arguments. There have been some arguments uh, internally with Victoria Alonso that one, that she was too, again, we're going back to the, I'm saying what the audience is saying. I'm not saying what we're saying. There have been complaints that she is too woke. There have been complaints that she cares too much about maybe homosexuals or representation. That has been the argument about Victoria Alonso. However, Victoria Alonso has been part of this whole thing since day one, worked with 11 different projects over over COVID. The projects were not great in the terms of CGI. Some of the projects were really great, but the CGI was not great, I think, to a lot of people's liking. Then you see um, you see Avatar, excuse me, come out and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? What's the deficiency occurring? She was part of that. This story just came out from Hollywood Reporter. I say the woke thing because this is coming out on that. I'm just reporting this, people. Everybody stay calm on the term woke. I feel like that word just gets people going. Gets people going. Apparently, the Hollywood Reporter is reporting that Victoria Alonso clashed with Marvel over blurring gay pride references in Ant-Man 3 for Kuwait. Um, So uh, it was reported originally by the Hollywood Reporter that she was fired for this. But she, in the contract, it has been said that she could not cross promote for other films and movies. So for the film Argentina that she was producing, she walked along with the Argentina cast and crew into the Oscars, essentially not walking with Marvel. So that's a visible. We saw it data proven moment that that occurred with her. Now with them reporting this, the, uh, the Hollywood reporter, she is known as a homosexual Latina and it, it's it's I think one of the criticisms people have made of Marvel is that, OK, the original cast was about the characters. I'm saying that in quotes because there have been massive changes in the originals. The Ant-Man people weren't involved. The Hulk had a shift of characters, things like that. I just think it's a very convenient argument in the, in the first phase of Marvel. We now get to this point and all the people that have been arguing this, all the sweaties that have been just really agitated about Marvel they feel like they have something going here. Is Victoria Alonso, my question, we're not going to get on the, the woke parts of this conversation. I'm just bringing it up because that article was just posted yesterday. Is Victoria Alonso a sign of Marvel actually ending? We've talked about Jonathan Majors. That's something outside they can't control. Eric Perlmutter, there was a history of mad gobbledygook, squibbitabop. That guy was on the way out anyway. But now Victoria Alonso is the biggest domino to fall in Disney. She is one of Kevin Feige's right-hand people. She has been with it since Iron Man, who I think Iron Man CGI, just palm to the sky, was really, really good, guys. Do we think this is a sign that Marvel is ending? Isaac, let's start with you. No. Uh, I mean, people, I mean, Robbie especially, you know, has been saying fall of Marvel, blah, 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 blah. As long as Marvel keeps making money, they're going to be going for years and years and years and years to come. Like this is not, this is not a sign of Marvel ending. And I will say like, I personally, I don't know a whole lot of like behind scenes productions and stuff. I didn't really know about Alonzo before she was fired. So all of this news coming out is all like new news to me, but she's been with Marvel since the beginning, worked herself into the role of basically like the director of post-production basically for the past, I, I don't know. It's, it's been a while. Like she's been b- the person behind post-production for years at Marvel. So like, I don't know to me, just job wise, if your if your movies and your shows are suffering in post-production, that just makes sense to me. Fire the person that's in charge of post-production. That's only job wise. And then like, is there to an go, argument though that she had too much on her plate? Cause I oh, think that's absolutely, a fair argument. Absolutely. That's definitely a fair argument. And that's just a whole Marvel thing overall. Like just, just looking at the broad scope of things when you have 
10 projects coming out a year, you can't put top dollar into every single one of those projects, which is, you know, why we've been hearing all this stuff with Marvel's like cutting corners on post-production. They're not treating their VFX artists the way they should. They're like overworking them, blah, blah, blah. All this stuff's coming out, which, you know, like who knows what the actual truth is behind the, behind the scenes. But the fact that all of this stuff is coming forth and public means you know where there's smoke there's there's a fire usually so like there's something going on at marvel studios and she is the one that is the director of post-production so to me it makes sense that she is let go and then and then you on top of that like you mentioned you've got the stuff at the oscars where she was directly contradicting her contract that was just a reason that marvel was like okay well here here you go like we already had, you know, like we wanted to kind of fire you, but now we have a reason to fire you because you directly violated your contract. So to me, that makes sense. I I mean, it's along the same lines of like, hey, you started Marvel, like, thank you for all your years of service. I'm sure she had a lot of stuff um, that she contributed to Marvel Studios and, and the MCU and all that stuff. But hey, if your product is suffering, like you got to do something to change that up and make your product better. So to me, I don't think that's a bad move. I think she was ruffling feathers. I think this story and has validity. I yeah, really do. I, I wouldn't be shocked if that were part of the picture. But I mean, you if she were ruffling feathers and she was doing a killer job and we had zero problems with VFX or CGI, would she be fired still? I think it was a bigger deal to Disney that she was promoting other stuff than the pro homosexual LGBTQ stuff, if that makes sense. Disney, Disney's done that stuff in multiple projects. Marvel's right. not the first one to do mm-hmm. that. So I don't think that claim holds validity. Right. I think whether you should do it or not, it's a different conversation. I think she got a little too big for herself. And I think she was like, Oh, I, I can do this. You can't fire me. I'm Victoria Alonzo. And they're like, actually we can, because you signed this in the contract. And CGI has been bad anyway, so why does might as well put somebody else there? Zane, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I kind of still just going along with that. It's the type of thing that comes to my mind of just like you get enough of the little stuff in there, and even at the the base layer, like at it, it could even just be a scapegoat. Like it, the, it's not unheard of for some company to just be like, all right, just put it on that you know one person, get rid of it, and you start over. But I think there is some validity to what you're saying of, you know, of maybe she got a little too, thought a little too much of herself or, you know, so on and so forth. But like what Isaac was saying, like it, it would be way different if we didn't have these glaring discrepancies in what the visual effects have been recently. Like if the visual effects were still just knocking out of the park, then all of a sudden she was fired. Then I think there's a valid argument of being like, all right, what's going on behind here? But like, there's definitely been a dip in the quality. There's definitely been all kinds of, you know, you hear all this stuff behind the scenes that, that, that falls on your director. Like that, it always falls on the person who's in charge. And like when that starts, you know, head starts rolling, that's who's going to get the blame for it. Cause you're in charge of that. You're in charge of the people under you. I don't know, man. The CGI thing just doesn't feel like fully her fault. It, it just doesn't this. I agree with you on the little things. I just I don't add the little things you're adding up on it, so that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think it's I mean the it other was it was things. a perfect storm basically because right. like with COVID happening and all the projects they already had going on, like she probably did roughly the best that she could. But at the same time, like what what are you going to do to improve this? And to be honest, we haven't seen a whole lot of improvement. I mean, like Ant Man wasn't terrible like it was it was decent cgi quality but like at the same time i just don't know if if that's something that the again there, there's smoke there's fire that we've been hearing so much about the vfx artists and and stuff like that and coming to the point where they're coming out themselves on social media saying that they were mistreated at marvel so again there's something going on and and she has to be a part of that like that's just how it is it's a part of it. I, I just don't think, I, and maybe I'm looking more like pro Victoria Alonzo than I am. I, I, I really don't care that she got fired, to be honest. I think Disney. I, would I don't do think fire. any of us are pro or, or con. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think she's like, I didn't have right. an issue. I didn't have an issue with her before. Maybe that's right. also what I'd say yeah. for clarity. I, I haven't, I, 
I think her promoting the other thing was a bigger deal than people think. Well, I think think coming into this now too, though, like what if you get a new person in here and then as new movies and stuff come out, what if the visual quality improves? Does that add any weight to swaying your opinion the other way? Sure. I, maybe I think so, but I also think that Disney's like money's tight for everybody. I think tight. I use tight loose for a big <laughs> corporate company like that. I'm just more saying like they, they're if they're trying to get back to that one billion in average per movie thing that that Marvel's done because Marvel's made like over twenty billion dollars, guys. This is this is the other part of the point. Like they're not going to just drop people because they don't like them. I think behind the scenes she was like, "Fire me, go for it." I think she, I think she really was like, look, I'll say all these things. I've been vocal about things that are really popular in, in the news right now, and I will put you guys on blast if you do this. I think she finally thought she had leverage, and Marvel was like, no, because we have other people in the building that would do the same thing. We cannot do that. And I, I, I think Iger's cleaning a house right now. I really do. I think Iger is like – I think people are like, oh, my gosh, 7,000 jobs are gone. And I think Iger's like, you're pointing at the wrong guy. You need to look at Chapek. He set us up for this. And COVID set us up for this. I think Iger's going, no, no, no. We're getting back to excellence where we were. And Iger's got a proven track record. So in my opinion, if he thinks that's the that's the game plan, then it's it stinks for Disney, but it's the right move. Yeah. I think I think like, you know, what like I said, it was a perfect storm. Marvel Chap Chapek basically bit off a little bit more than they could chew. COVID happens and it just showed how much they were putting out there. And I mean, something has to give, and she was just a part of the cog that had yeah. to give, I think. so. It sucks for Kevin Feige, because Kevin Feige did not, was not part of the decision. That has been reported multiple times. Go ahead, Zane. What if, uh, you know, money's so tight at Disney, as Max was saying, what if Victoria Alonso was let go because uh, she refused to join in coupon clipping with everyone else? <laughs> like, money's tight, guys. Disney just has like an hour a day set apart to clip coupons that that go to Disney. Yeah, that's more likely than I. That's more likely than that she was bad at CGI. Let's be honest. <laughs> 11, 11 projects. I empathize with her deeply for that. Let's go to the final order. I was gonna. T- we were gonna talk about Shazam: Fear of the Gods. Uh, three, th- uh, uh, th- four point two out of six. 4.8. No, I said 4.8. 4.8 out of six. Yeah, I'll say 4.5. 4.5 out of six. It was better than Quantum Mania. That's my review of it. Text me if you want to know more. Shoot me a DM at MaxMojo73. Let's talk about James Gunn taking over this this All Star Superman thing. We haven't this this came out a while ago, but we have not talked about it. And I received a piece of feedback from somebody that they wanted to hear our thoughts on it. So, uh, shout out to DJ Blase out in Minneapolis uh, for reaching out. Um, I saw Shazam. I'm going to give some spoilers to Shazam right now. Are you two okay with that for the post credit scene? Yeah, you haven't seen it yet. Nobody's seen it yet. It only has still to. haven't seen it. Yep. yep, nobody cares. In the post credit scene of Shazam, it is revealed that um, that the Justice Society of America is being established and built, and two characters from the Peacemaker show put a oh, gag me. <laughs> two characters from the Peacemaker show arrive. And one of them is, of course, James Gunn's wife. Uh, and uh, things I said a couple episodes ago, Isaac, are starting to happen, is how I'll put this. So anyway, uh, long story short is it was revealed afterwards that The Rock did indeed sabotage the entire process of making Shazam! Fury of the Gods from the perspective of uh zach levi who uh went public and he said all this on his instagram feed and on youtube um interviews that essentially the rock took himself out of or or took characters from his movie excuse me that were part of the justice society of america so allegedly adam smasher and cyclone were supposed to appear at the end of shazam theory of the gods in the post credit scene to invite zachary levi shazam into the justice society of america but that got axed by the rock and because of that levi's really pissed he thinks that that's the reason the movie's really struggling really the movie's just not doing well because dc is making a massive change that james gunn is part of now but what i said months ago I said this. I said, you watch. Everything will be built around Peacemaker. And here we are. Once again, Zachary Levi giving me more evidence to be upset. James Gunn now in charge of All-Star Superman. And I trust James Gunn as a director, but I'm the jury is still out on if this DC thing is going to work, in my opinion. I do not think I am in the same camp officially 
as Robbie, I do not believe that the rise of DC has begun yet. I think it is plateauing still. Hand to the sky, that's where I stand. What do you think of this information now that you've heard this from uh, actor Zachary Levi? Zane, we'll start with you because I feel like you're the most likely to agree with me. I want you to agree with me and feel good about myself. Yeah, I just like it just seems such a petty weird thing. Like we're talking going from one side of Marvel, talking about like big groundbreaking things. They come over to DC and like Rock didn't use these characters. They took the, and it feels like it's a schoolyard squabble. And you're just like, no wonder no one cares about these movies. Like I, it, it, I just don't care. Like I, there's characters I don't care about and you're fighting over them. And you're just like, I, the best shot they have of building anything is with James Gunn. Hmm. Like it, that, that, that's the truth of it. Like, unle- and if they can't build anything, it's just going to be the same thing over because they can't establish anything. They're characters you don't care about. And you're, it's just going to be continuous of like, well, we're just going to throw Batman at him again. We're just going to throw but Superman is this at nepotism? him again. Is, is this nepotism by putting his wife in? And she was in black Adam too, everybody. I don't want to hear like, I don't want to hear that James Gunn has this like brand new plan guys. I really don't want to hear it. I, I, I really think, He's just throwing Peacemaker characters into this to make them the main characters. And it drives me nuts. They Peacemaker should have nothing to do with the Justice Society of America. And you guys watch. He's going to be in the JSA. You watch. I think it's ridiculous. I don't Because he has a hilarious dance at the beginning of his show, he should be in JSA. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this is stupid. That's how I really feel. Go ahead, Isaac. I mean, <clears throat> really, this movie was just set up to fail by this whole DC reset. 100%. The the post credit scene of the whole movie is basically irrelevant by this DC reset. So that's why it's failing. It's not because Zachary Levi, it's not because of anything that's going on in that movie or anything related to Black Adam. It's because everybody knew this movie was irrelevant. So like what's the point in going to see it? And I've heard actually good things. Like I've, I've heard people say that it was a fun movie. It was a it was. good, it was solid, fun. like yeah. fun, enjoyable superhero mm-hmm. movie. It was better than quantum mania. The, and I'm fine with Zachary Levi saying all this stuff on social media, because ultimately it does show that, I mean, the rock like was meddling in things. And this is probably prior to us knowing that James Gunn is resetting. Things. I'm sure the rock made this call way before James Gunn took over the reset or whatever. So if that were the case, then we're talking because that's a lot more important. And like that would have changed the future of the DC moving forward. But now that James Gunn is at the helm, it, it doesn't really matter. So like, sure, go ahead, Zach Levi, like, you know, speak your truth on, on social media. Speak your truth. (laughs) Like, I don't like, it doesn't matter at this point. Like it's, it's fine. I don't, I don't think he's, I don't think he's wrong in saying all that stuff. Like it probably could have been a better movie and it would have been a cooler post credit scene if those characters had showed up, but ultimately it doesn't matter either way. So, and, and Zach Levi, like for all the stuff that's been going on around him, like this is one of the least controversial things that he's said recently. Like he's, he said a lot more stuff that has been weirder. Like we, we talked about, I just, I want to mention one thing though. We, we talked about in our group chat about how he mentioned how <laughs> this just it got a chuckle out of me. So I got I got to mention it. He's saying way, way wackier stuff. He's saying that like the Joker and serious roles like that, like, yeah, anybody could do that. It takes a real actor to make pop culture references and jokes on screen like he was doing in Shazam. Like, that's the gist of what he said. And it was just like. <laughs> okay, like if I, like this is not that's not the hill you want to die on, Zach. Like like I, move I on. would Zane and I have always agreed that the Joker is a is not as deep of a role as people make it as out a to character. Be. Yep. Honestly, overrated overall. Yeah, as overrated to to act to act. I'm not talking about the comic portrayal. I'm talking about the act. But to go out and say that his the character that he is <laughs> takes a better to actor. say that playing a kid who is making pop culture jokes about memes and TikToks and gobbledygook. <laughs> That's ridiculous. You're absolutely right. I would echo that. Zane, do you agree? Yeah. 
Okay, let's move on then. Thank okay. you. Okay. Zachary okay. Levi's nuts. I agree. <laughs> he's he's known for Chuck and for wearing a muscle suit in a movie. All right, let's get to the main event while we're here. Did you, how many people you think click the link and then they're like, ah, oh, they're not even talking about Mandalorian. They're on. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we get them. And today I'll be showing out day for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do time time stamps. There's no. It's like the uh, like when you're online and you're trying to find like a recipe. And you just want the recipe, but they give you like this whole article. Yeah, that, that's us right now. That's us right okay. now. Hundred <laughs> percent. We yep. are just a disaster. And if you're listening to us on Patreon, you're hearing some awful, awful thing. <laughs> Peter Ramsey directed episode twenty-one, chapter twenty-one, excuse me, of The Mandalorian, episode five of season three. It was written by John Favreau and George Lucas is back. It's awesome to see him get writing credit. Pedro Pascal, Katie Sackoff, Carl Weathers is back again. His grief carga, love him. And uh, Tim Meadows making an appearance as Colonel Tuttle. I liked that a lot. Liked that a lot. Is that who you were referencing, Zane, when you said a a cool appearance in this episode? Or who are you referencing? No. Who are you referencing? Isaac, Isaac knows who I was referencing. Uh, I was referencing to Zeb. He's a character from Rebels. And when they when Grief sends out that hologram asking, uh, I don't remember the pilot's name for help. But as they're sitting there and he's kind of sitting at their base. Carson Tava. Yeah. Zeb walks over to him and that's the, the big, the purple monkey looking dude that talks to him. Zeb, okay. is a, Zeb is a huge character in Star Wars Rebels. He's part of the ghost crew with Sabine Wren, with Ezra Bridger, with uh, why Harrison Dula. Like he's a huge part of that group. So seeing him, I was just like, like I actually had to pause and like rewind and I'm like, that's Zeb. I was, I was like, and they don't play it up any. They don't call him by his name or anything. It's just he just walks they up. They confirm it on IMDb that he that is Zeb. So it, and it's I like believe confirmed. that is who. It, it, did you just say this, Zane? Forgive me if I misunderstood you, but C- C- Captain Carson Tava talked to him at the end, right? That was who he was talking to at the beginning. Yeah, yeah but, at, but I'm saying at the end when they were uh, when he was looking through the the ship that. Um, that was all tattered and broken and had uh, deceased people in space at the end. Was he talking to Zeb then, or was he talking to Colonel Tuttle? I think he was talking to Tuttle. Yeah, he was talking to Tuttle then. I'm, I'm pretty sure Zeb was just in that the, that that hangar scene. Yeah, well, that's good. Thank you for the thank you for the clarity on that. Uh, and also, Katie M. O'Brien is back as Aliyah Kane. It feels like she's now a series regular at this point. Um from her previous roles and uh, he's just doing more interviews and things like that as well. on IMDb, you can check those out. Um, a lot happens in this episode, but I'm going to go ahead and start with our rating of this episode. I'm going to go first cause I'm not nearly as educated as everybody else, but uh, I am a 5.8 out of six on this one. I really liked it. A uh, couple of brief things. I think it did drag a little bit in the, in the middle of this episode, not a ton to where I'm like, whoa, but I think, the transition stuff from Teva to like getting to the Mandalorians was a little slow. And, uh, but man, it, I really, it, this really captured the pirate theme. It's amazing how star Wars can capture every genre. It's very similar to Marvel in that vein. And I think this was a great episode of just capturing that pirate feel on the, uh, sailing the ocean seas and the pirates are overtaking you. I really loved that. And I appreciated that about this episode. Well, especially too, like I just couldn't help but kind of giggle it to myself too. When the pilot or the, I don't remember the captain's name, but yeah, as they're floating over the city there and all of a sudden he's like, all right, boys, man, the cannons. And it actually yeah. comes yeah. out like a pirate ship. I was like, <laughs> that's great. brilliant. Yeah. That is it brilliant. Was, great. Yeah. Filoni and Favreau are, are at their best in this episode for sure. And uh, it, it was just evident. This was a very well-written and executed episode. I really appreciated that. 5.8 out of 6 from me. Zine, go ahead. Broken record on this, but it's 6 out of 6. Seeing Zeb was fantastic just because of everything you watch with Rebels. And it just it's always fun to see what Favreau and Filoni like, bring in from other stuff you've seen. Um, to see him. And then, yeah, like you said, the bringing back the pirates into it was such how they incorporated that. It was just fun. It was, you got action. I, it is valid. What you're saying, it, like the whole, when Tava like flew to them kind of like drug on a little bit, but like it was too, it took too it, long. Everything else from the fighting, to getting the Mandalorians, everything else that happens in this episode was so much fun. And it's just like this, like this is what you watch Star Wars stuff for. Like, th- like this is 
kind of, I don't want to say it's the epitome of it, but like, this is the stuff that's just like, Hey, we got, you know, Mandalorians fighting space pirates that actually are like pirates. And like, it just, it, it just, it was kind of in that vein that only I feel like star Wars can pull off. And like, this is what you watch star Wars for. Completely agree. Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, I am going to echo everything Zane said. Basically, this you watch this episode and like that's what I was thinking throughout the whole episode. I was like, this is Star Wars, man. Like <laughs> this just feels like Star Wars. And we've gotten a lot of Star Wars content in the past couple of years that really hasn't because they're they're trying to do different things. Like it's it's kind of along the same veins as Marvel with Phase 4. Like they're trying different things out. They want to expand, you know, uh, the their universe and stuff like that. Star Wars has been trying different things. And I loved that I watched this episode and I was just like, man, this is just classic Star Wars. Like you feel the the vibes. It just it just it gives you a good feeling. You're watching Star Wars, you know. Um I, I'm gonna give this one a I'll I'll go along with Max. I'm gonna give it a 5.8. Um I, I think the same a little bit of the same complaints like slight lulls Zeb, seeing Zeb in there, fantastic. Pirate vibes, incredible. Um, just and the I will say this season and probably the show in general, dog fighting has been top notch Star Wars. Like absolutely incredible. Um, you know, speeder action with with the N one Starfighter. Like absolutely love like that's becoming my my favorite ship in Star Wars right now because Mando like just comes in, saves the day on that thing. And it's it's awesome every time. Like it, it's so much fun to watch the watch the dog fighting in this series. So top notch on that. I, I think everything about this episode is was really great. Um, I, I don't give it a six out of six because there have been episodes of the Mandalorian that made me stand on my feet and like yell applaud. Yeah. Applaud. And and that did episode, this episode didn't make me do that. But again, like you said, Max, uh, Tim Meadows, Colonel Tuttle, (laughs) my gosh, that was such great, such a great appearance. I was like, I saw him and I, I always think of mean girls (laughs) when I think of him. Uh, and just, Oh, that was such a, such a great role. I, I love, uh, him in that. And I did love actually one thing that I, I really did like about this episode. And I assumed this was going to happen when we got episode three and we haven't done a couple episode recaps. So for those of you guys who are watching it, episode three was the episode with, um, Katie O'Brien as, as Eli Kane and the, the doctor that we saw in episode or season one of the Mandalorian that episode kind of dragged a little bit and it, it, it drug a lot. It definitely felt like, um, and Max, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on this. You got to watch Andor cause, um, yeah. you got, mm-hmm. you got some serious Andor vibes there. They kind of were going, it seemed like they were going for that, like spy thriller, um, feel in that episode. It didn't really, it didn't really pull through on, on that episode, but her appearance in this episode is is a minor redemption of that episode. And I think it's even going to get better as we go throughout the season, because it just seems so jarring in episode three that we came back to her and this doctor who have not been major, you know, characters save for what, I mean, season one of the Mandalorian and like half of season two, like just, it, it just seems so jarring and out of place. That was that was the ep- that is a building for the future payoff episode, no question. Exactly, and and we like you know we probably knew that when that episode aired, it just wasn't as exciting as you know we're used to with these like sweet Star Wars action scenes and stuff like that. But seeing this little part of her and she plays this role very well, she's very like creepy almost like conniving like you you see that she's got something going on but she's putting on this like happy face i'm doing what they're asking me to do type of thing and i i i love that little snippet at the end of this episode where she was just you know like just and just like i don't know i don't know the words to describe it creepy is the thing that comes to mind but that's not the right not the right word, but like, you know, that there's something going on. The weakest part of the show, I think has been her Isaac, if I'm being honest this season. Yeah, no, the and that's part fair. Of the show's, that's and fair. That's, and that's not even necessarily a bad thing to me. I, I think the payoff is coming. I, 
there's something down the line coming with her. We it's, and I don't think it's crazy to assume that that's something that the Mandalorian, I feel like has not done a perfect job of in previous seasons. Like it's such a, an episode to episode show like with, you know, Mando, Hey, Oh, we got to do this mission, go complete this mission and, you know, come back to, you know, base or whatever. Like it's been such an episodic show that it's nice to see that they're building towards the end of the the season with that episode. So I appreciate that. Again, not the most exciting episode, but they are are setting us up for the future, which which you don't see as much in the first two episodes of the or seasons of the Mandalorian. You see it, but it's it's definitely like they're they're taking a painstaking approach of like, hey, this is for the future of this this season. So I appreciated that. It's they're definitely a little bit of a redemption in my eyes of episode three. From that. a third party perspective that doesn't watch the rest of this stuff that I probably will never I'll watch Andor, I think, but I won't watch Bad Batch. I I appreciate <laughs> that that guy came in. It didn't affect my viewing experience at all. I'm glad to know that information now moving forward. And I'm glad that you guys were able to get more out of it. That's how these shows should should be executed. And, and that's they did a fantastic job of that because they didn't make a big deal out of it. Like like if they had made a huge deal out of it, then it alienates the Star Wars fans who haven't watched that. You know, haven't watched Rebels or like you, Max, who you know you. It's Cad Bane and Boba Fett. That's what it was, and 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 it needed to be. Uh, there needs to be a reintroduction. That's how I'll say it. Right. A reintroduction where you can make references to the old. You can writing. You can make that happen. That is so easy to do. Right. You can make references. Where it's like, whoa, you remember that reference? But then for me, I'm like, okay, I have an introduction to this character. I don't feel taken out. I feel like I am part of the cool kids because I think that's the Star Wars problem. It's like this cool, not cool kids, but like it's nerdy kids know all this stuff. Oh, it's, and cool it's, 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 yeah. it's 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 only cool, cool kids. kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's just extremely difficult to enter into that sphere, I think, sometimes. And I think it's the same for Marvel now because of the same kind of thing. If you don't have a backstory understanding of these characters, you, you're you intimidated to step into the project or the product. And I, I think Marvel and, and Star Wars have to both be better at this. I think Filoni knows this, though. And I think Favreau definitely knows this. Favreau, I think, knows this. I think Filoni tends to lean more to the nerdy side. I think Favreau leans more to the no. We got to market this to everybody's side, and I, I think it's really cool that Lucas is on this. Let's talk about the end real quick, and then we'll transition because we got to start lead. I, I have a meeting in nineteen minutes. I just realized I can't. <laughs> um, which has been talking so much. Um, the end. We find out that uh, Moff Gideon was taken from that ship, and it was uh, using some type of Mandalorian attack. Some Mandalorian came in and did it. Who do we think it is and why do we think it's the armor? That's my opinion. <laughs> I think it's the armor. I think she did it. My uh, my building theory of who the armor potentially is actually kind of coincides with your theory there, Max. Um, so it's a popular theory that I've seen online. And the more I, like, I read and the more it makes sense is um, that the armor is going to be Rook cast. Now, to anyone not familiar with Clone Wars or anything like that, that's just going to be, wow, it just sounds like a Star Wars name. But So the significance of that character is once his Death Watch splintered in Clone Wars because it split because uh, Pre Vizsla challenged Darth Maul to a fight. Darth Maul beat him. And then it fractured Death Watch because Bo-Katan was like, there's no, we're not going to follow a non-Mandalorian. So she took her people and then um, Darth Maul led who, who stayed. Rook cast was Darth Maul's like second in command. And the reason, another thing that kind of adds into this is the people that um, followed Maul, it was very common that they would put spikes on their helmets. What does the armor have on her helmet? She's got those spikes. And so that's a very popular theory online. And it's one that I, I, the more I see, the more I align with that. I think it's going to be Rook cast. And that's also, I think why there's cause nowhere else in any of the lore is this whole helmet thing, such a big deal, but it would be a huge deal. If you were the one who followed Darth Maul to, you know, supersede everything. And if you were the ones and you don't want to give up your identity to be, you know, Hey, we were the ones that are personally responsible for what happened on Mandalore. 
So it makes sense that like, ah, we're going to hide all of our identities so people don't know who you are. Do you think that entire colony of Mandalorians is from that sect? Or do you think it's just her leading those people and the rest of them are being bamboozled as well as our Mando? No, well, I think it's bits and pieces because like – Paz Vizla, like he's wearing the Vizla armor. The he's the dude with the heavy. I feel like she's gonna kill him. I feel like that's gonna be the heel turn if she kills Paz Vizla. Well, it's possible, but like at the same time, Vizla, like he was the original Death Watch. So like, how do you get it, how do you get him to follow her who split off from Death Watch? Well, you never show who's under the helmet. Yeah, right. And so, and then even the fact that their whole group is called the Children of the Watch. Well, yeah. I mean, Night Watch Children, like. There's a lot of pieces there of saying that, like, hey, we're trying to – we established this whole never remove your helmet thing. But now that you look more into it, you're like, I feel like it's more so you're trying to hide who you are instead of being like, hey, we just are really cool and never take off our helmets. Like, Do I you feel think like- then this allows them to use Pedro Pascal without his helmet more down the stretch? Too? Yes. Yes. That's, that, so you you think they're trying – I'm hearing you say also we got to get this helmet off of Pedro Pascal. Well, I feel like there's that instance, but you could also break it down of, hey, we don't always need to have your helmets. But then it would also add some of that – the give him kind of that Master Chief from Halo vibes. Sure, yeah. Of – it's the cool guy who never takes off his helmet. You yeah, he's he could in instance right. And that would add more to that the mystique that is the Mandalorian, you know. He he holds his own right. His his own um uh sect. Right. There. Isaac, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean I, I don't have anything really to add besides that. I mean that's a that's a deep cut Zayd, and I appreciate that you that you have that. I think the only thing that I I, and I'm sure it's been discussed and over and over again online and stuff, but like the timeline maybe doesn't line up for it to be Rook cast. Um, but somebody, I don't know, like she would be old at this point. Right. Like, cause this is, this is like five years after, after uh return of the Jedi, which takes place, I believe 20 years after clone wars, like she'd be like old. At this point, if it were, I don't even think it'd be that old, old, though, because she wasn't that she, old. I mean, she, she was, was like, she was, she wasn't young. She wasn't old. She wasn't old in Clone Wars, but like she was probably, I don't know, like, I don't think they give an age, but she's her probably like. style too, Isaac and Zine, allows for if she takes that helmet off, old d- Bad Batch deep cut people are going to know who she is. Yeah, yeah. People that Clone that Wars are people fans of Clone Wars, right, right? Exactly. And I don't think it's necessarily impossible. I just think like, and she is like, as the armorer too. She is like kind of that, like she gives off that older, like wise type vibe. So it definitely could be possible. Um, but yeah, I, I I like the um, the point that you made about the uh, horns on the Mandalorian head, though, because that is that is a really cool callback to. Uh, that portion of Clone Wars. And if, if you guys are looking for more, you definitely need to check out the Mandalorian portions of the Clone Wars because there there's some fantastic storytelling in in that and and in in uh, Rebels as well. Some really cool Mandalorian history and and back backstory. So uh, but yeah I, I think I don't have like an alternate theory. I just have questions about <laughs> about that theory. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I think the armor heel turn would be a, a really cool storytelling. And and now like you, Max, you mentioned that you think uh, she might kill like Paz Vizsla as like, that, her that heel makes turn. complete sense. Cause he's the biggest, baddest one in my opinion. Yeah. And it would be such a, like, it would be such a, such a just deep emotional cut, especially after they just, they just saved Ragnar. So now Ragnar, what does he do? Does he fall along the Mandalorian steps? Right. Does she take him? Does do they do it in private? Does she kill Paz Vizloff in private and only the Mandalorian knows? And then Ragnar goes off with her. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can work that Ragnar character. They've made it very, very, very evident that he's important from episode yeah, one. I agree. I they agree. showed I his induction. He's, definitely- he's the next generation. He him and Grogu, I think that's kind of the pairing they want to have from dec- from years to come. Maybe they speed across the timeline after all this scene, after what you're talking about. Maybe it's like a 10, 15 year bump. And then Grogu's kind of looking the same, but Ragnar is now a disciple of Mandalorian. I don't know. 
we get a spinoff show uh, that's a buddy cop between Grogu and Ragnar, and they're like, you know, like they're just doing Mandalorian <laughs> stuff. Down there, like, oh my god, a Ragnar property if done correctly and with this type of turn I mean, you're talking about, Zane. I think I mean, a lot of people would like that. Yeah. Even if it's a kid, what if it's a kid traversing space? True. I mean, yeah. that's an option too, because then you don't have to take his helmet off, and you can always you can actually do that for six years. Growing into the teenagers. That's in essence a way of kind of telling the Boba Fett story without retelling the Boba Fett story. Because that's that's exactly what Boba Fett did. Like in Clone Wars and in Bad Batch now, too, like we get stories of these kids who are pretty prominent in in the story arc, and they're like kind of off on their own doing pretty important stuff sure. so i think that would be cool if we got like uh, a youngling or a r- really young kid that you know has their own show or you know is important in the storyline of a show or something like that that would be cool look at us look at us just putting things together but we've been doing this for almost two hours because we always record for 40 minutes before <laughs> patreon so unfortunately we're gonna have to cut this short i thought we could get the bad batch today i apologize to our audience i'll make some edits on the front end so we don't pitch that out the gate but this is some good conversation. I want you to keep the conversation going, though. If you're listening to us, if you got to this point, you clearly are invested. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or join our Discord. Let's keep this conversation going. What do you think is going to happen with the armor at the end of this? Where is Moff Gideon? What do you think is going on in this show? And you have no excuse to not talk about it because if Max Moser can kind of talk about this, anybody can talk about this. That's my big opinion on this. Uh, but great episode as always. A lot of good stuff to talk about. And uh, we're looking forward to D&D and the Mario Brothers movie coming up in a couple of weeks. We'll be reviewing that as well. Uh, Zane, thank you for coming on today. Uh, thanks for having me. Was it good, good, good to be here. You know, Sleep well. You know, I, I do what I can. Sleep well. <laughs> uh, Infinity Bro Isaac, thank you for coming on today. It's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure to see Zane's beautiful face in the mornings. It's a face. That is true. It is here. It is a face. It is a face. Uh, Thank you, Infinity Bros Universe, wherever you listen, however you listen. Thanks for your party podcast experience. Uh, We talked about everything in the show notes. It's all going to be below there. Hey, but no, we love you guys 3000, and we'll talk to you soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Infinity Bros Podcast. You can find the Infinity Bros on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the Infinity Bros. Feel free to send listener feedback via email at infinitybrospodcast at gmail.com.